Hi, my name is Tim Gibbs with the Delaware Academy of Medicine and the Delaware Public Health Association. Welcome to the third in the Delaware Mini Medical School series. The first two sessions were held with a live audience and due to COVID-19, we have moved the series online. Today, we're gonna to hear from Justin Martello. Dr. Martello is a board certified neurologist specializing in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease at Christiana Care. He earned his medical degree from the University of Maryland in Baltimore. He completed his neurology residency as well as his fellowship in movement disorders at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Martello, welcome. Right. So thank you all for being here virtually. Um, I am uh, Justin Martello. I'm a movement disorder specialist at Christiana Care, as you as um, Tim mentioned, and so I will be leading this talk on Parkinson's and movement disorders, uh, pretty much my wheelhouse, what I do 100% of the time, um, mostly Parkinson's, but a few other things that we'll capture, um, and that's kind of all right here. We're going to do this in pretty much a case-based uh, kind of scenario where I'll be going through some cases to kind of describe the, di describe the different uh, disease states that I see and treat. And these are kind of briefly the ones that we'll be mentioning today. We'll have a lot about Parkinson's disease since it is kind of the more common of the ones here with the exception of a central tremor. Um, you know, 80% of my patients fall under Parkinson's disease. So it's kind of one of the bigger ones. Technically, a central tremor is the most common movement disorder um, that does exist, but that tends to be less um, impairing um, for most patients or for a, a large amount of patients and so they don't necessarily um, go to medical attention so most of them are Parkinson's and, and the rest that you see here. All right so case number one so Miss A um, so these are all kind of real cases that um, you know that we'll be talking about today so she is a 64 year old woman uh, retired botanist um, and uh, I always like to put the profession of the person it helps me remember the patient also in my line of work uh, that tends to be an environmental hazard a lot of times for why they may develop a lot of these neurodegenerative conditions so she's a retired botanist uh, about one year ago developed tremor in her left hand uh, a blank expression this was described as a blank expression or staring off uh, weakness in her left hand and she's a quote-unquote active sleeper um, and this is usually uh, kind of mentioned by you know the significant other at the time we'll talk about this in a little bit but we also as mood disorder specialists love videos and so we'll be showing you a lot of videos coming up um, and this will be your first one So you can see there's kind of a resting, um, what we call pill rolling tremor. Um, kind of looks like a, she's rolling a, a pill in her fingers. Um, obviously more on her left hand, a little bit on her right hand, just a tiny bit. In front of you, please. And this is what we call. There's no real postural tremor. Right back the other way. But there is a tremor with her walking. And back towards me again. Good, if you can stop there. Now, if you'll take your left hand and just hold your arm up a little bit, and if you'll just tap your index finger and thumb together real quickly. You can see she doesn't have great amplitude. There's some hesitation. And now the right but hand, not, same not thing. Extraordinarily fast there. A just the index finger right and thumb, hand. just the two fingers. There you go. Good. Now, if you'll tap your right toe quickly. You can keep your heel on the ground do the sitting down, and just tap just your to toe. Demonstrate that she's somewhat Excellent. fast now the left on the right toe. side and, and slower there on the, on the left side. And then gets slower as she does it. All right, so this is Parkinson's disease. So what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease uh, that in, mainly involves a loss of dopamine producing cells. Uh, these cells are located in the area of the brain we call the substantia nigra. It gets its name from black substance, which when you look at it under pathology, uh, the producing cells look black. And when you have a loss of them, you have a diminished of that black substance. Uh, and, and really the mainstay in Parkinson's does involve dopamine. There are other players involved, but that's kind of the major player is just 
Um, just like any other vitamin or chemical in your body, you have a deficit of it. So we'll talk about what that means for treatment in the, in the future. Um, so um, the main symptoms that go along with Parkinson's include slowness of movements and you saw the kind of specific slowness because it's not just in general slowness, it's more of a specific kind of uh, slowness um, or what we call classic bradykinesia. Bradykinesia just means slowness of motion uh, that you see kind of a slowing of movements of the more they do it and a decremental uh, kind of amplitude the more that they do it. There's also a specific type of stiffness that we call cogwheel rigidity where there's kind of hesitations as you're moving around their limbs instead of one kind of stiff limb all the way through moving it around it kind of is loose and then stiff loose stiff type of a feel to it tremors and we'll talk about specific types of tremors associated with parkinson's because not all tremors are parkinson's it's mostly certain types like a resting tremor or like i showed you in the video if you're resting your hands in your lap and you start and the hands start shaking on their own that's what we call a resting tremor and then balance impairment usually not in the beginning but eventually you have um, walking and balance impairment eventually and then much more and we'll talk about what else we typically see in parkinson's disease uh, april is parkinson's awareness month just fyi um, and that type of symbol that you see with the tulip is kind of the um, unofficial official parkinson symbol all right, so uh, Parkinson's affects about one to two people out of a thousand, um, but it definitely increases with age. So there's about a one percent of the population over 60 with Parkinson's. Um, the annual incidence is about four to 20 per 100,000. Um, obviously, the, the longer you live, um, the higher the prevalence is, although technically uh, the incidence or the kind of yearly average of developing Parkinson's spikes around the 60s. Um, and then goes down after that, uh, but obviously the accumulation or the prevalence, uh, you know, goes up as, as you age. People do now have an average life expectancy with Parkinson's disease, uh, and specifically in Delaware, the, uh, there's a 2017 uh, Lewin Group study uh, in conjunction with uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation that estimated about 3,400 Delawareans with Parkinson's disease. This is actually up from 2,000. Patients estimated just six years earlier. So in six years, that rose about 70% in population in Delaware, which makes sense that Delaware is a popular uh, retirement place. Um, and there's some questions about maybe environmental risk factors in Delaware uh, that we can talk about. Uh, so more epidemiology. So there's about a million people in the United States and 10 million people worldwide with Parkinson's, this is more than multiple sclerosis or MS, muscular dystrophy, and ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease combined. About 60,000 new Americans are diagnosed with Parkinson's each year. Um, it was uh, found to be much more prevalent in, par in, in males than females, or at least we thought that was the case. Now, not so much, and we don't really understand why that is yet. Um, definitely still more prevalent in men, but, we, but this number, um, back before we had more data on it, used to be you know three or four to one. Now it's much closer, but still more prevalent in men. So when we talk about Parkinsonism, which this can be a little bit of a misnomer, especially to patients, um, we just mean that you, we see symptoms or signs that are similar to those in part with who have Parkinson's disease. So Parkinsonism just includes the slowness or bradykinesia, the, the rigidity, the tremors, balance impairment, um, kind of a catch-all term, um, just like saying if you had a cough, that's not really a diagnosis, just you have a cough for different reasons. You have Parkinsonism from different reasons. We'll talk about that later. What other reasons you can have Parkinsonism from? Obviously, the most, most of the time people who have Parkinsonism have Parkinson's disease, but there are other things that can cause uh, Parkinsonism as well. And just to, as a kind of side note I mentioned in the slide, uh, not all Parkinson's patients have a tremor. That's also te technically a misnomer in the, in the public as well. Everyone thinks you need the tremor to have Parkinson's disease. And about a third of patients don't have any tremor who have Parkinson's disease. So I created this slide because I like it is a good, good way to uh, illustrate the other symptoms that a Parkinson's patient typically deals with eventually or at some point in their disease. Now, not everyone has these symptoms. And in fact, we say, 
if you know one person with Parkinson's disease, you know one person with Parkinson's disease because it is very much a spectrum of a disorder. <clears throat> so not all patients will get all of these symptoms, but I do still like to show this uh, um, illustration because it just uh, gives you a good sense that, especially when you see someone with Parkinson's and they look quote unquote good, uh, that they don't always feel good because uh, a lot of these are what we call non-motor symptoms. I've told talked to you about so far the what we call the motor symptoms, uh, things that you can see and experience physically, uh, but there's a lot of internal symptoms or what we call non-motor symptoms that we'll talk about. And, and with the accumulation of these non-motor symptoms, patients will just tell you, I just don't feel like myself, I don't feel well, um, and it's probably because of all of these underlying issues going on. So what are them? What are they? So, um, you know, the three typical ones we talk about, slowness, stiffness, tremors. What else can we see? So cognitive impairment, uh, dementia. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, nightmares, vivid dreams. Um, just sleeping problems in general, they typically uh, wake up and can't fall back to sleep. Um, there's something called REM sleep behavioral disorder, which is where when you're in REM sleep, which is the deepest um, stages of sleep, uh, usually your body is paralyzed. So you're kind of motionless. But um, in, in REM sleep behavioral disorder, which highly correlates with Parkinson's disease, along with some other related diseases we'll talk about, uh, what happens is you lose that paralysis and so your body tends to act out the dreams and it tends to be violent and, and you're punching and kicking your sleep you're thrashing around so this isn't someone who just looks restless and they're tossing and turning this is actually you know uh, really high amplitude movements of their body usually calling out or shouting as well um, and and uh, so that's that's highly correlated with parkinson's apathy and so a lack of motivation so these patients you know, a lot of times you'll talk to someone and if you ask them how are things going, they say, fine, but I just don't want to do anything. I just want to sit here. Uh, you may say, oh, wow, you sound really depressed. While depression and anxiety are highly correlated with Parkinson's disease, apathy is too, and it, come, and it can come quite separate to these issues. So people can say, no, you know what? I'm really not sad. I'm really not happy. I'm just kind of here. I'm just kind of blah. I just don't feel like doing anything. And it tends to be a very hard thing to treat. Um, and so that's uh, unfortunately one of the issues that, that they deal with. Like I said, depression, and anxiety, either with the apathy or separate. Hallucinations, delusions, what we call psychosis in general, um, can happen up to, you know, depending on the numbers, between 30 to even up to 50 to 60% of patients at some point in their disease. Um, usually it starts off very benign. Like I saw a black shadow running across the, my peripheral vision or a corner of my vision, or I walk into a dark room and there's a lampshade that I thought was a person for half a second. And then I turn on the lights, there's no one there. So it doesn't tend to be just one day, you know, you, you're just seeing people walking around. It starts out very benign and then gradually gets worse. So there can be vision changes, changes in your smell. Um, Changes in your speech, so there can be usually a lower volume or what we call hypophonia um, or, or a slurred speech or hoarse speech, uh, what we call dysarthria. It can be drooling, nasal drip, uh, swallowing problems eventually, usually later in the disease, blood pressure fluctuations, especially drops in blood pressure, constipation, uh, slowness of your stomach movements, pretty much slowness of your whole GI system, uh, erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, fatigue, dystonia, which we'll talk about later, kind of an abnormal muscle contraction, and gait and balance impairment. Um, so you can see that this is a lot. Obviously, this is not even everything. We'll, we'll go over the next slide or uh, uh, next slide about what other things we can see. Now, I, I highlight uh, the REM sleep behavioral disorder, the loss or, or lack of smelling abilities, uh, what we call it, anosmia, along with constipation, because these are three of the pre-morbid conditions that tends to be associated with the risk of developing Parkinson's. So if you have all three, it's almost guaranteed at some point in your life you're gonna develop Parkinson's disease. And actually what it means is Parkinson's is already developing and that you will show more obvious physical symptoms down the road at some point. Uh, the problem with this disease is that all of these features that show up, with the exception of what's highlighted in green, um, 
when they happen, the damage is already done to the brain. So you're, you've already had loss of dopamine producing cells, which is why curing this disease and treating it with good, um, even disease modifying therapies has, have not been great or able to be done because by the time we catch it, like I said, with physical symptoms, the damage is done to your brain. So we're trying to find more of these pre-morbid uh, symptoms that we can maybe catch uh, these early, what we call prodromal Parkinson's patients. Uh, so we can start researching them on, on how to treat it before uh, too much damage is done. Now, what, what other symptoms can we see in Parkinson's disease? So we can see uh, this actually tends to be a symptom that a lot of people will notice first, especially caregivers, loved ones, friends, that there's, they're not swinging one of their arms. Usually Parkinson's disease develops in an asymmetric way. So one part of your body is affected before the other. And so just one of your arms will stop swinging or won't be swinging as much. Um, one of the symptoms that patients may notice at first is their handwriting is much harder to do. It's much smaller, what we'll call micrographia. Um, again, loved ones tend to notice this kind of what we call mass facies or kind of this blank expression um, that they have. Uh, shuffling gait, uh, again, um, loved ones tend to notice. Uh, patients tend to notice a lot of what they perceive as weakness. They had difficulty arising from a chair, difficulty in just using strength in their hands. And what they are misperceiving is that it's not a true weakness that comes with the disease, which actually can eventually happen, but not in the beginning. It's that bradykinesia, that rigidity that the patients never experienced before. And so when you tell someone to for example, make a fist really fast. And there's that second of hesitation because of the bradykinesia and rigidity. The brain doesn't understand that, and so it misperceives it as a weakness. So sometimes it's just in general, patients will be like, I just have a lot of weakness, especially on my left side, right side. The side that affects is random, so whether it's dominant or non-dominant side is totally random. Uh, well, we talked about the hypophonia already. Uh, freezing of gait, so this is where someone's walking along and their feet get stuck. A lot of times it's when they first want to take a step, their feet kind of get stuck to the floor. They have this hesitation. Um, they can eventually get moving, um, but that's what we call freezing of gait. Then there's what we call on block turning, where instead of a quick turnaround, they have to kind of take multiple steps in order to turn around. A lot of patients start noticing a kind of hunched over posture. Uh, festination is a type of gait where all of a sudden your feet will start moving faster and faster. and even smaller steps and to a point where you're running but not really going very far and then a lot of times they'll tip over because their top half of the party wants to try and catch up to their bottom half which tends to have a problem to keep up keeping up with each other and then drooling as well we talked about <clears throat> so the movement disorder society or mds uh, clinical diagnostic criteria for parkinson's which is still very much a clinical diagnosis. We'll talk about testing in a second. Uh, so you need the classic bradykinesia, the classic slowness of movements that I showed you in the video. And then at least you need either the resting tremor or the specific rigidity, uh, cogwheel rigidity that we're looking for. Now there are some supportive criteria, red flags for the diagnosis, but this is kind of the baseline uh, criteria. As far as testing, we usually don't really need any testing. Um, this is one of the interesting things about treating Parkinson's is if you come into my office or your loved one, I can pretty much diagnose you right then and there uh, if you have Parkinson's or not. Now, there are some times when your history or your exam may be a little bit complicated or confusing. And so in that case, uh, maybe we'll get some further imaging with an MRI or a CAT scan of your brain. Now, this won't show Parkinson's. So it's not like we're looking for Parkinson's in this case. We're more looking for other reasons why you might have Parkinsonism, like I mentioned before. There are other reasons, and so maybe this would be a good first step to rule out some of those other things. Now, there is a test, called, uh, imaging test, called the DAT scan. Uh, it's, a dopamine, it's a nuclear medicine dopamine label, transporter labeling image. Um, this can be very helpful to confirm the diagnosis or to lead you towards the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Now, if it's abnormal, and one of the downsides of this test, which I'll show you an example of an image for, is that it's a qualitative test, kind of like an MRI. You, you see a picture and you're kind of examining the picture and you see, does it look abnormal to you or not? It doesn't give you any numbers or data. Um, and so it's uh, not perfect. Um, 
In fact, its only indication technically is to distinguish between a Parkinson's tremor and an essential tremor, which tends to be an easy thing to differentiate clinically anyway. I tend to use this for other reasons. Um, it cannot be used for disease severity or prognosis. So it's kind of a yes, no answer. Um, what I tend to use this for is more drug-induced Parkinsonism or medication-induced Parkinsonism. Uh, so there's certain antipsychotic medications, including anti-nausea medications that can cause a Parkinsonism syndrome. Uh, vascular Parkinsonism. So when you have vascular disease affecting your brain, people usually think of strokes, but people can have a cerebral vascular disease that slowly uh, starts impairing the brain uh, and can cause Parkinsonism symptoms and signs. Uh, NPH, which we'll talk about later, normal pressure hydrocephalus, to, di to kind of differentiate that between Parkinson's, sometimes I'll get this. Psychogenic um, or functional Parkinson's tends to not be as common, but if someone, if you think someone doesn't necessarily have an organic disease, uh, not that they're faking it, but that their symptoms um, are not the most, uh, um, you know, related to any structural changes in the brain, then we'll get it for that. Now, when a DAT scan is abnormal, all it tells you is that this patient either has Parkinson's disease or one of the four Parkinsonian syndromes or Parkinsonian plus syndromes. We'll talk about them later. So really, it doesn't even tell you definitively Parkinson's. It just says one of the five Parkinsonian syndromes. Um, usually, we're able to tell which one uh, based off other symptoms and findings on exam, but just to, it's not a perfect test. And then lastly, there can be insurance issues with coverage and it can be very expensive. For example, uh, patients can spend from $500 to $7,000 on this test, which is why I tend to not get it because it doesn't tend to be more helpful than, than my clinical exam and, and assessment uh, will be. Um, the only other thing that I will say is because we don't have a uh, medicine to cure Parkinson's or even slow down the progression, a lot of times we will use other ways to test, does this patient have Parkinson's? So one way we do that is by starting medications. Uh, the medications are pretty specific for Parkinson's. So if you, if the person responds and they should respond dramatically uh, in their symptoms to the medications, that's a pretty good bet that it's Parkinson's. So a lot of times I'll just use the medicines as the ultimate test uh, if they have Parkinson's. Lastly, uh, again, you're not losing any time by confirming the diagnosis um, because, again, um, it's not like I would have tried to do something early on that I'm not going to do eventually. Um, and so a lot of times time will be the test. Um, the way that they progress will uh, make it more obvious as to do they have Parkinson's, do they have one of the other Parkinsonian conditions, is it not Parkinson's. So a lot of times you do have the uh, benefit of waiting um, before you confirm the diagnosis. So this is, a, is an example of a DAT scan and what the picture looks like. So you see um, on, the, on the left, you see the DAT scan up top and then the um, actual gross pathology on the bottom. You can see the substantia nigra, that black kind of line, that black substance of cells uh, producing the dopamine is normal on the left and reduced kind of um, concentration on the right. And then you see on the DAT scan, uh, well, technically it's a PET scan, but they look the same. Uh, there is a diminished signal, uh, mostly, now the images are reversed, so this is actually, even though it's the right side of the picture, it's, it's the left brain that we're looking at that has the diminished so, uh, amount of dopamine transporter, so you don't see that nice red, dense uh, dopamine transporter kind of groupings within uh, what we call the basal ganglia, or the putamen and caudate. Uh, nuclei, and so you see just a lot of diminished signal, and you can see it's asymmetric, right? So again, the left brain, again, right side of the picture, um, is a little bit less than the other side. So how does, uh, so usually Parkinson's disease progresses in a, what we call linear fashion, and so uh, after having the disease for a few years, uh, and, and we kind of plot out how they've been progressing, you can kind of extend that line into the, fit, into the future to see how this patient will progress in um, going out. So usually things don't abruptly worsen for a Parkinson's patient. Now, as, as far as how they advance in the way that they respond to medications, this, I like this chart because um, what this shows you is, so over the x-axis is time, uh, y-axis is 
the um, levels of dopamine in their system. And what you see here, uh, kind of outlined here, is if you were to take an oral medication that supplements you with dopamine, your dopamine levels go up, and then as the medicine wears off or as the dopamine is used up, the levels go down. Now, anything within that green window um, is levels that really treat the symptoms really well. Um, and so a lot of times patients take the medicine, it works all day for them. They may need it multiple times a day, but it works all day, it works great. They don't have any, what we call off periods or wearing off periods. Now, as the, the disease progresses, regardless of medication use, you have this narrowing of the therapeutic window. And so what happens is um, any, any levels of dopamine above the therapeutic window or that green area, that's when you start having what we call dyskinesias. And those are the kind of abnormal, restless, kind of writhing movements, dance-like movements. I'll show you a video of that um, in a different disease type, but what it may look like. But it's kind of, it looks restless. It's kind of all over the place movements. Um, and then anything below this therapeutic window, the medicine's not working, they have symptoms, uh, they don't have a good response. And so it starts to become an issue with really getting those uh, uh, dopamine levels within the therapeutic window without going too high or too low. The fortunate thing is nowadays we have, depending on how you count it, um, up to 17 different options. Um, and again, potentially more if you count it differently, but uh, uh, on treating Parkinson's symptoms. Now again, None of these medicines slow down the progression of, of the disease, but we do know that by using these medications to help the person's physical abilities, to help the person's quality of life, that that can actually infer a longer, um, uh, a longer life expectancy and a slower progression. It didn't used to be the case that people had a normal life expectancy with this disease, but the way that we've approached the disease now and the way that we aggressively treat the symptoms, we think that by allowing patients to be more physically active uh, and by having better quality of life, that that actually infers a better uh, and slower disease progression indirectly. Because we do know that the one disease modifying therapy that we can offer them is something that they can do themselves. So exercise, physical activity is the only thing that slows down the progression of Parkinson's disease. And so that, um, uh, besides that, uh, you know, these medicines it can make a dramatic impact and help them to be able to get to being as active as they possibly can. Um, and so uh, these are the different categories of medications. And I think what better illustrates, and, and I, I bolded the fourth category, levodopa, uh, otherwise known as, used to be known as cinnamon or carbidopa levodopa. Uh, so this is the mainstay of therapy for Parkinson's. This is the medicine that is the oldest. It's been out since 1969. Uh, still, unfortunately, is the best medicine and is the best well-tolerated medicine because it's the m cleanest medicine, quote unquote, or the most natural medicine. It, uh, your body, with an enzyme that it already has in, its, in your body, converts it directly into dopamine. So there's no middleman, there's no indirect way it works. Um, and so it's a really clean, nice medicine. And that's why most people not only tolerate it, but most of not everyone winds up on levodopa at some point in their disease, if not in the beginning. And there are different formulations that you see here we'll talk a little bit about, um, long-acting formulations, and then there's other medications. This is looks like a, a really complicated slide, but it just goes to show you that there's different um, parts of your body and, your, and the dopamine system that we can use medicines to really act on to help the dopamines not only to give you back dopamine, but to help your natural dopamine uh, work better and to, to really work on your natural dopamine receptors in different ways. So there are ways that we um, kind of, uh, and, and well, before I mention that, there are actually dopamine receptors throughout your body. Uh, and so dopamine is released and works on different parts of your body. Now with giving you back dopamine, we really want it to get only to the brain because what we found is that if dopamine gets converted, uh, if the levodopa gets converted and, and delivered to the rest of your body, that's when you can run into side effects. So some of the medications are, are all about stopping that uh, conversion in the rest of your body. That's why the carbidopa part is there, of carbidopa levodopa, that helps deliver it to the brain. There's also things that help break, um, block the enzymes that break down dopamine so that it can last longer in your brain. There's things that can block uh, the breakdown of natural dopamine, block down the breakdown of levodopa. 
there's medicines that can work just on the dopamine receptors called agonists. So there's different uh, medicines that we can use um, in, in different ways to, to really help. And that's what we're learning more and more about. So physical therapy is super important um, also in Parkinson's disease. And so um, really helpful for, for fall prevention, balance training, because uh, there's really no medicine for balance. Uh, so getting them involved in physical therapy early is helpful. And then check-ins usually at least once a year. Uh, they'll teach them how to use assistive devices when need to be. Uh, when need be, um, they can help show methods and cues on breaking freezing of gait. Um, and so super helpful. Speech therapy is also helpful. Uh, there's a big and loud program that incorporates both physical and speech therapy for Parkinson's patients. Um, and it helps really with the speech part, the, the low volume of speech, which tends to be a huge issue in Parkinson's disease. And, and again, something that doesn't tend to respond to medications, more with going through this uh, therapy. Um, and it can also help with uh, cues for freezing of gait as well. Cognitive training is under this purview of speech therapy. Um, and then they can always help if they need hearing aids, especially uh, the elderly uh, tend to need that. Now, there is no uh, specific diet um, or supplements that have been shown to be proven uh, in uh, Parkinson's disease. However, the only diet that's been consistently proven to help with brain health in general and to ward off dementia is the Mediterranean diet. And so that's the diet that, if anything, I recommend. Um, but otherwise, there's nothing specific. Now the protein issue, um, so uh, some of the medicines, especially the carbidopa levodopa, can uh, be somewhat inhibited by food uh, as far as the absorption in your, in your GI system, and especially with protein. Now usually in the beginning of the disease, we don't tend to worry about this, but eventually uh, we do get more worried about the protein issue. Now there are certain um, what we call advanced therapies that we offer. The top three pictures show you what we call deep brain stimulation systems. So um, I'll show you a picture of that and explain that in the next slide. Um, bottom left just uh, shows you that um, I do Botox injections for different mu abnormal muscle spasms that can be associated with Parkinson's or sometimes we call them dystonia. You can have dystonia and muscle spasms for other reasons, but um, you know I do Botox injections for that or I should say botulinum toxin injections because there's actually different uh, brands of uh, botulinum toxin. Botox is the most common, but there's three others as well, Zeomin, Dysport, and Myoblock. And then the bottom right just shows you what's called a Duopa pump system. This is a continuous infusion of carbidopa levodopa into your small intestine called the jejunum. And that's actually the area of your body that absorbs the oral carbidopa levodopa. Now we bypass the stomach because the stomach really starts slowing down, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, with gastroparesis with Parkinson's disease. And so if the medicine doesn't make it through your stomach, it's not going to make it to your small intestine. And so that's when we really start having what we call motor fluctuations. So these kind of the highs and lows um, or where medica medications don't work at all or there's a delayed effect of the medicine because it really has to get through your stomach. So in order for the medicine and the dopamine levels to stay consistent throughout the day, and your brain really likes to see that naturally too, it likes to see a, a consistent level of dopamine throughout the day, we're trying to do this better um, with different pump delivery systems that bypass the stomach uh, for levodopa. Now this is deep brain stimulation, um, kind of an example of what it kind of looks like. So you have uh, kind of a pulse generator or a battery pack, almost like a, a, a pacemaker uh, connected to wires all underneath the skin. And this is connected deep into a person's brain uh, into um, leads or electrodes uh, that helps to stimulate the cells in certain areas of your brain there are different targets to really help with a lot of the Parkinson's symptoms. We use this also for essential tremor uh, to treat tremors. Tremor is the most um, effective and uh, consistent symptom that is treated with this system, but other things can be treated as well. I'll show you an example of, a, of an essential tremor patient later who has DBS and the difference what they've seen with it. Now, technically, this is a brain surgery, but it's a uh, uh, as routine as you can get, I guess, for brain surgeries. Um, there's over 175, 180,000 people who have had this done over the past 30 years. Um, 
it's only involves a very small hole and and what lowers the electrode down into the brain is this machine that does it very slowly and very uh, fine tune uh, wise and and we monitor you the whole time um, so it's becoming a, a easier and easier thing to do um, that's pretty safe so medical marijuana parkinson's uh, get questions a lot about this so i like to talk about it um, so right now, uh, while there's no technical FDA-approved uh, indication in Parkinson's, it is kind of approved to be treated in painful spasms. And while it's not common for Parkinson's patients to have painful muscle spasms, it can happen. And so that would be a reason why I would use it. It's not really an exact science. And so um, unfortunately, uh, there's um, not really a great way uh, to, to, to dose this um, or even administer this. Uh, and so a lot of patients tend to get really frustrated with this because they don't know how to use it um, or what doses, what concentrations. We used to think that the CBD portion of medical marijuana was the helpful portion, but there's a recent slide about, uh, a recent study about um, the THC may be somewhat helpful for, for Parkinson's patients, so we just don't know. We also don't know long-term risk data with Parkinson's, right? So yes, mar marijuana has been around for thousands of years. So we know it's relatively safe, but we don't know necessarily in Parkinson's patients, is it a safe thing or not, at least long-term. There was a study a couple of years ago, it was a small study, but it um, suggested that there may be an increased risk of dementia for Parkinson's patients who use this. Um, and it's not a miracle cure. If, if you've ever seen the Facebook video uh, for a Parkinson's patient who uses it, they're kind of sitting on, on the couch, kind of tremoring away, can't really move. They use medical marijuana and they can walk and move normally. To be honest, I can show you that same type of video with Leave It Open as well. So um, yes, do some people get great benefits from it? I'm sure. Um, but it's not still not well known, well studied yet. And insurance doesn't cover it, so patients of mine who use it every week, or I should say every day, spend about $60, $80 every week on it. Now, the exciting thing is that, um, you know, Parkinson's is a very active and expanding um, disease as far as the amount of money in research. Besides Alzheimer's, it's kind of like the second highest in, in amount of money being being infused into it, uh, at least neurologic, uh, considering neurological diseases. And this goes to show you that over the past five years, we've essentially had two or three new developments in therapy-wise every year. And this, is, this year is going to be no different. We have one already. Um, another one should be approved within the next few months by the FDA. So um, kind of uh, ever-growing field, with, which is pretty exciting on a Parkinson's end. And hopefully, as far as the future of Parkinson's, we have new levodopa delivery systems, um, like I mentioned before, bypassing the stomach. So now we have an, a rescue inhaler um, that's out. Uh, hopefully subcutaneous, less invasive pump systems, patch systems, things like that. Hopefully we get our first disease modifying agents. Um, these are just a few that are in studies right now, um, but um, some of them are getting pretty close. Uh, you know, I, I used to be optimistic. It's hard to be optimistic since so many failures in, in this line of, of studies um, over the past several decades, but I think we're finally getting closer to something that may actually help. And then um, we really need better uh, biomarkers for Parkinson's, not only to follow a disease uh, state, um, but to use it for prognosis, diagnosis, to differentiate between the other Parkinsonian syndromes. Because right now, which, and we'll go over the other Parkinsonian uh, syndromes in a little bit, but there is no differentiating factor um, between them. Again, it's just clinical diagnosis and following a patient to really be able to tell which Parkinsonian syndrome they have. And then there's a new technology called the MRI guided focus ultrasound. Um, this is a technology that can make a lesion using um, a thousand ultrasound beams located, targeted at one spot in your brain to treat some of the symptoms, uh, specifically tremors, dyskinesias that happen in Parkinson's disease. And then um, dementia is still uh, um, not only in general, but with Parkinson's an area that we need better meds for as well. Uh, so um, 
as far as biomarkers, uh, wearable technologies we're trying to get a little bit better at as far as not only tracking someone to make sure how much of a fall risk they are, analyzing their gait potentially as a diagnosis for these patients. Again, biomarkers, seeing how they progress, uh, using it for prognosis. Um, but we haven't found a really great one that, that accomplishes all these things and is feasible, cost-effective, and patients will want to use it. As you can see, some of these are full-body ones. They're never going to be using those. All right, finally to case number two. That was all case number one, all Parkinson's, but let's see what we got for the case number two. All right, Mr. B, 71-year-old retired farmer, uh, two years ago, uh, decreased left arm swing, shuffled gait, constipation, decreased sense of smell. So already got two of the things that I mentioned before about precursors to Parkinson's, so constipation and uh, anosmia. And we got another video. So here we go. And now back the other way for me, please. So you can see he's not swinging his left arm at all. Now, a lot of people might see this person walking down the street and figure that they had a stroke, right? Kind of holding that arm flexed. Looks like maybe they just have, back have weakness. But actually, this is a Parkinson's patient. Uh, can look a lot like a stroke patient at times, but uh, this is just shows you that. Uh, can't always tell, right, when you're watching someone walk down the street. Um, having said that, just to go back for a second, um, I, I did include retired farmer because as far as uh, environmental exposures, the ones that we know about for Parkinson's include uh, farming chemicals or pesticides. Uh, if you were a welder in the past, other if you worked in other chemical like factories, carbon monoxide exposure, things like that. Uh, there's actually a detailed list of the chemicals that we know of that can contribute to increasing your risk for Parkinson's, but um, st still not there yet as far as learning all of the risk factors. Obviously, many people are like, well, I don't have any of those risk factors, so why did I get it? Uh, as a quick comment, we only know that about 10 to 15% of Parkinson's patients have a clear genetic risk uh, for Parkinson's. The rest of them are probably mostly environmental and maybe even tied in with genetic factors that make them more predisposed to Parkinson's in the right conditions. Um, and so uh, really learning what those conditions are has been difficult. We have had some interesting findings uh, through the studies in the past, things like um, coffee drinkers tend to be less likely to get Parkinson's. Uh, tobacco smokers tend to be less likely to get Parkinson's, although we don't recommend smoking, obviously. Um, so interesting that we used to think dairy uh, made you more at risk of getting Parkinson's, but that didn't really necessarily pan out that well. So still trying to look for those environmental risk factors. <coughs> All right, case number three. Mr. D, 73 year old man, retired chemist. One year ago developed word finding and memory issues. Um, his walking tend to slow down hallucinations at night and um, he was having these ideas that his wife of 52 years is cheating on him. So don't have a video for this but um, we'll talk about where in line this patient, um, uh, what, what kind of diagnosis the patient has. First I want to mention about Parkinson's uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment. So this usually involves someone who has issues with memory, usually short-term memory, um, executive functioning, meaning planning, organizing, multitasking, doing advanced things like finances, driving, um, language issues, word finding issues, um, and, and then visual spatial issues, uh, death perception, things like that. Now there's about 30 to 40 percent of the patients will have Parkinson's disease, dementia, or PDD with about an 80 to 90 lifetime risk. So eventually by the time they die, they'll have it. Um, so patients who are males, the, higher, the older they are, the longer they've had the disease, having severe motor impairment and having psychosis tends to increase your risk of dementia. And this tends to increase your length of stay or LOS at hospitals if you do have dementia with Parkinson's. Now, what's the difference between Parkinson's disease dementia and Lewy body dementia? Because this comes up all the time. 
Now, the picture in the top right is of a Lewy body. A Lewy body is a accumulation of an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein. Um, so it's kind of, usually your body is able to, through kind of a garbage disposal system, take out these pro proteins. But for whatever reason, and that's what we're still trying to learn, is your garbage disposal system in Parkinson's and Lewy body uh, dementia is, is not working. And so both of these diseases actually involve an accumulation of this abnormal protein into what we call Lewy bodies. So it's kind of a misnomer about um, saying that Lewy bodies patients or Lewy body dementia patients are the only ones with Lewy bodies. Parkinson's also has them as well. Now, while you can have early dementia or early mild cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease, um, usually when you're talking about Lewy body dementia, it's much more dementia and much earlier on. Um, the differences between these diseases is usually where the Lewy bodies accumulate, and we don't know why that happens in certain patient, patients versus others. Uh, Lewy body disease is usually much more faster progression um, with not only dementia, but gain and balance impairment, um, autonomic dysfunction. So your autonomic nervous system controls things that you can't think of, like blood pressure and heart rate fluctuations, your GI movements, uh, sweating, body temperature regulation, things like that, or your um, uh, urinary system, things like that. You have these fluctuations in attention arousal, so they'll kind of go from randomly falling asleep and sleepy to awake uh, type of fluctuations. And then usually uh, when you have Parkinsonism with Lewy body dementia, which um, we'll go over the definition in a second, but usually it's bilateral, whereas um, Parkinson's is asymmetric. And then here's the real differentiating factor between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease dementia is that the psychosis, the visual hallucination, hallucinations mostly, or the delusions, delusions are kind of facts that are not based in reality, like my significant other of 52 years is cheating on me, so we call it delusional jealousy. Uh, it could be, I think my mailman stealing my mail, or I think I'm being spied on, those are kind of delusions. Illusions are what I described before, when you walk into a dark room, there's actually something there, a lampshade, but you misperceive it as a person, that's an illusion where there's actually something there. Um, <clears throat> Now, if this psychosis happens within the first year of having Parkinsonism motor symptoms, um, that's a pretty good bet that this is going to be a Lewy body. So that's what this patient has because they develop what we call early psychosis at the same time of having Parkinsonism. Now, if you kind of lined up or, or kind of put together two patients, one had Parkinson's disease dementia at some point in their disease and one had Lewy body dementia, they may actually look like the same patient. The difference is all about the history. So a lot of patients will come in and say, I'm, I'm worrying I'm developing into Lewy body. No one develops from Parkinson's into Lewy body dementia. You all have always ever had one or the other. Now it's true they may be on the same spectrum, but they are on different ends of the spectrum. And so it's um, usually if you've had Parkinson's disease for 10 years and you're now just developing psychosis, that's still just Parkinson's disease with psychosis. Um, you know, Lewy body patients who have developing for 10 years are pretty debilitated, if not deceased by that point. So for these patients, you know, we who have a lot of dementia issues, you know, we review their medications. A lot of times that'll be playing a role in their cognition. We look for what we call a pseudo dementia. These are aspects that um, when reversed um, tends to make your cognition better. And so it mimics uh, dementia, why, why we call it a pseudo or false dementia. So if you have sleeping problems, uncontrolled depression or anxiety or uncontrolled pain, you can have really a lot of problems with focusing, concentrating, word finding, memory. That's why we even see in teenagers, um, if they don't get good or great sleep before a test or uh, a few nights before a test, that they'll do much, much worse than uh, kind of age-related match peers who get good, uh, good sleep. Uh, we can use melatonin, other medicines to, to help with this issue. We get some blood work. These are to review um, for re other reversible causes of dementia. So if you have thyroid issues, vitamin B12 issues, diabetes, things like that. Um, and then sometimes we'll get an MRI of the brain, although again, with Lewy body and Parkinson's, you're not going to see necessarily anything abnormal on an MRI. Neuropsych testing potentially sometimes, and then uh, sometimes a PET scan can help with other dementias to diagnose them. 
And then a DAT scan, Lewy body will show up abnormal in a DAT scan too. So it's not necessarily helpful to differentiate Lewy body dementia from Parkinson's, but um, it still can rule out some other things that we might be thinking about. Um, so a lot of times we'll treat, again, some of the pseudo dementia related things, depression, anxiety, insomnia. There are some dementia meds, they don't really work that well. We try and avoid neuroleptics or antipsychotics with the exception of a few there. Um, sometimes stimulants we look into, a lot of it is about caregiver support. Dementia syndromes, whether it's Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's, Lewy body, they really put so much more pressure on the actual caregiver than they are the patient. Actually, uh, quality of life studies have shown this, that uh, the patients tend to necessarily not be as bothered by it as the caregivers are. So a lot of times, uh, caregiver support is huge because a healthier, happier caregiver leads to a healthier, happier patient. Uh, so fall and home safety. So falls, um, swallowing problems tend to really progress these patients a lot faster. All right, next patient, case number four, Mr. and Mrs. C. So these are um, going to show back-to-back -back videos here, and we're going to take a look at what they have and then talk about it. All right, so you can see a resting tremor of her right hand here. And then she holds them up. And as I talked before, you're looking for a postural tremor. Now, at first, there's nothing. And then there, it develops out of rest um, or a resting position in the air. So what we call this is a re-emergent tremor because it re-emerges out of being still um, when they held it up versus a central tremor. Uh, tends to occur right away. When you hold up your hands, your hands will start shaking immediately in a central tremor. Here again, you have a right hand resting tremor. And it will hold it up. And again, initially nothing. And just spread your fingers. And then oh, after there several you seconds, just keep them right there. Um, the tremor starts. And this re emergent tremor we typically see in Parkinson's. So these are, again, two pre patients with Parkinson's disease. But as long as we're talking about tremors, um, We'll talk about the differentiation between Parkinson's tremor and essential tremor, and then I'll show you a video of an essential tremor patient. Uh, so usually Parkinson's is, um, when, it, when you develop the tremor, it's more acutely, right? It's over several months to a year, versus the central tremor, a lot of times patients will say, oh, I've always had this tremor, or, or it's been very, very slowly progressive over many, many years, if not decades. Uh, there's usually a highly correlated family history of tremor with essential tremor uh, than there is with Parkinson's. Um, essential tremor tends to respond to alcohol. Not that we use that as a treatment, but we tend to ask them, uh, do you usually drink or have you, do you drink at all? Even one glass, do your tremors get better type thing. Um, again, with essential tremor, you see it more with posture. They raise their hands up and they start shaking or when they're trying to do something with their hands or what we call an action tremor or kinetic tremor, they're writing or they're trying to pick up a glass versus Parkinson's tremor usually is only at rest. Sometimes it can be with posture and sometimes it can be with action, but mostly it's just at rest. The frequency of the tremor is slower in Parkinson's. So you see kind of that three to six hertz uh, resting tremor versus the central tremor is much quicker. Um, with essential tremor, it's usually bilateral. Your hands have it equally, or at least somewhat, mostly equally, maybe a little bit asymmetrically, versus Parkinson's usually is very asymmetric, at least early on. Eventually, it will spread to the other side and can be as equal. But um, uh, And then with essential tremor, you usually have involvement of your hands, um, your voice, your head, or neck. So a lot of people who you see have a head tremor, either have a central tremor or what we call cervical dystonia, which I'll mention later. Um, and then, you know, Parkinson's disease obviously has a lot of other features that a central tremor doesn't. A central tremor is purely just the tremor. All right, so we'll take a look at this video and we'll take a listen to this person's experience with not only the tremors, but also with, um, he has deep brain stimulation. We'll see what that does to his tremors. On. Uh, my device is off. I'm going to give you an indication of how I, how much trouble I have writing my name. As you can see, it's not going too well right now. Yeah. 
you certainly can see what the problem is. Hey, I got a jack out of there and the J doesn't look too good, but... Now I'm going to turn the device on. See what happens here. Okay, this is with the device on. Amazing difference. This this is what I'm I'm talking about. Uh, it's just so much different. It's given my life back to me. I would recommend anybody that has any kind of a, a, a tremor that is concerned about it to talk to their doctor or their neurologist, get it taken care of because it's a life changing experience. There's no question about it. All right. So um, just as a kind of side note, uh, you know, I will say, you know, while tremors is not something that's going to eventually kill you um, or shortens your life, uh, it's extraordinarily um, bothersome and as a big quality of life issue. People get to a point where it's hard to feed themselves, to, to drink, uh, to write, um, do other things. Uh, and so even things around the house, screwing in a screw, uh, hammering a nail, you can imagine. Um, and so, uh, you know, initially people are like, why would I ever go through brain surgery for this? Why would ever, anyone ever go through brain surgery for, an, it's essentially an elective brain surgery. And what I say is, if you knew it was safe and it was that dramatically helpful, I mean, would you do it? And, and so we don't even reserve this for the last ditch effort anymore. I mean, um, in fact, we know that patients do better the earlier they get it. Um, and why not get a device that, that is helpful uh, potentially for most of your life, earlier in your life when you have more years left than necessarily waiting to the last, last um, you know, years of your life. So, all right. So um, many different things, as I mentioned before, can cause Parkinsonism. Um, I alluded to medications can cause Parkinsonism, usually antipsychotics, anti-nausea or anti-emetic agents. Other different medications can cause it, other toxins, like I mentioned about the exposures. Um, talked about vascular Parkinsonism already. Um, the one interesting part in this list is uh, normal. So what do, what do I mean by normal aging? So what we know is that as you age, you know, you develop orthopedic issues, um, arthritis issues, uh, you're just slower, you know, less active in general. And so you can look slower, stiffer um, for a number of different reasons. And so there was a study looking at uh, patients who definitely didn't have Parkinson's, but did they have features of Parkinsonism and the prevalence with age? And you can see uh, the older you get, the more likely you're going to have some sort of Parkinsonism symptom affecting your body, likely from what we call multifactor, multifactorial issues going on. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about the Parkinsonian plus syndromes that are highlighted here um, uh, and talk about some other things, but we'll take a few minute break and uh, come back. Um, we will be moving on here. So case number five. So we got a 55 year old man, this is Mr. E, he's a welder. Uh, six months ago developed balance impairment, lightheadedness when standing up, um, constipation, decreased voice uh, volume, and somewhat high pitched at the same time. So we're gonna move into the synucleinopathies. So this is the, um, these are the three Parkinsonian conditions that involve alpha-synuclein as one of the main players as far as what accumulates and starts to happen to cause uh, the disease symptoms and the disease process. So we've already talked about Parkinson's disease or PD. And we've talked about Lewy body dementia or LBD, but now we're gonna talk about MSA or multiple system atrophy, which is actually what Mr. E has. Sorry again, I don't have a video for this, but uh, MSA, uh, so um, pretty much it's um, a rapidly progressive Parkinsonian condition. Median, as you can see, survival is seven to 10 years. 
Um, it's not that common, so there's about one to every 30 Parkinson's patient. But what it involves not only with Parkinsonism, but also what we call the autonomic failure, autonomic nervous system failure, as I mentioned before. So you have a lot of blood pressure fluctuations, especially drops in blood pressure, um, problems with swallowing early on, problems with gait and balance early on, uh, antrocolis, which is a type of um, dystonia affecting your neck where your head kind of goes down like that. Um, this kind of high-pitched nasally voice, um, REM sleep behavioral disorder can happen. Those, um, uh, so this is kind of um, un one of those more unfortunate syndromes. You can have uh, two different subtypes of MSA. You can have what we call a poorly levodopa responsive Parkinsonism subtype, and then a more cerebellar um, syndrome with ataxia, kind of balance issues, uh, dysmetria with your hands, things like that. Case number six, uh, Miss F is a 61-year-old woman, retired pharmaceutical scientist. A um, year and a half ago developed kind of this staring look, um, balance impairment, double vision, drops food on herself. Uh, so already you're hearing about this early gain balance impairment. Um, that would be too early for Parkinson's. So what's the other group um, uh, that actually Parkinson's also falls into this grouping as well, but we call the tauopathies. This inclu includes a, a protein called tau that develops in the brain instead of alpha-synuclein. You have this tau protein that abnormally accumulates in the brain um, and so uh, contributes to, like I said, also Parkinson's, but PSP, which we'll talk about in a second, and then CBS, which again we'll talk about. So PSP, or progressive supranuclear palsy, um, again, uh, pretty, pretty aggressive Parkinsonian condition. Um, uh, usually, uh, as far as time length between diagnosis or motor symptoms and death is somewhere between seven to, to 10 years, usually same as MSA. Um, and, you, and one of the really the noticeable features, you have this kind of what we call a shocked look or kind of surprised look at times, anguished look, um, more so than with Parkinson's patients. You have, a, uh, uh, as per its name, a, a reduced uh, vertical gaze. Um, so not only uh, you can't really look up and down as well anymore, but really uh, what we call saccades or quickly looking up and down is really diminished. Um, and so there's ways to show that on exam. Uh, you have this what we call early, like I said before, early gait and balance impairment, frequent falls, um, different frontal lobe signs like the applause sign uh, where you kind of have someone clap or you say, follow what I do, you clap three times and they kind of keep going. It's kind of what we call a frontal release sign. Um, and then um, dysarthria, swallowing problems early on as well. And usually with neurological conditions, it's with thin liquids first when you have uh, swallowing problems. This is, just, uh, this is one uh, MRI sign that you can see with PSP. It's not there all the time um, and it's not necessarily that diagnostic, but you can see what we call a hummingbird sign. So PSP is in the middle, and you can see the, the beak of the hummingbird, um, kind of belly of the hummingbird, um, versus kind of Parkinson's on the left, um, and then MSA on the right. You see more atrophy in the, what we call the pons area and the cerebellar area with MSA. All right, case number seven. 76-year-old retired pesticides manufacturer, over the past three years developed this kind of what we call useless, or he calls it a useless left hand, balance impairment, swallowing difficulties, um, usually with liquids and then stiffness. So again, you're hearing about early balance impairment, early swallowing problems. So you're thinking one of the Parkinsonian um, syndromes. And we got, we got videos again, so let's go through them. Now, if you'll show me with the right hand how you would hammer. Good. Now, if you'll do the same with the left hand. So if you can't hear, um, just asking how would you hammer in a nail? Pretend like you would hammer in a nail. And you can see with the left hand, even All though it's All right, now with the right hand, if you'll show me how you would turn a key in a lock. Not as accurate as the right hand. And this is turning a key in the lock, and he does that pretty Good. well. Good. And now with the left hand, if you'll show and me then that. And you can see with the left hand, he, again, obviously he's heard you. He knows what he wants to do, but the left hand just won't quite do okay. how you would now. motion someone to come towards you. Again, how would, how you, would you call someone to come over? Someone to come over Good. To you? Now with, with the left hand. hand. And then with the left hand. See, uh, again, 
he does get the gist now of it, with the but right it's not hand, as, as comfortable Show me how you would hold a right toothbrush hand. and brush your teeth. And how would you brush your teeth? Show me how you would brush your teeth. With your right hand. And now with the left hand. And again. Not as smooth there. So this is what we call apraxia, which is um, highly correlated with cortical basal degeneration syndrome, or CBS. Uh, so apraxia is, is a term that means that uh, you can no longer do or remember how to do learned motor functions, um, uh, or at least with one side of your body, as it is here. And that is usually very asymmetric in presentation, uh, not only with apraxia, but with uh, limb dystonia and rigidity too. Um, and so they have this really stiff, kind of rigid, but also dystonic. So a lot of times there'll be a posture of the hand or of the arm, uh, what we call dystonia again. Um, and so you usually see this really just affecting one limb. Eventually it does spread to other parts of the body, but early on it's very asymmetric and quickly and onset. And I'll show you another example of apraxia and, and something that's also highly correlated with CBS called alien limb syndrome. And so um, hopefully you'll be able to hear in this video. You see her, her hands kind of hanging in the air. She's actually not doing that on purpose. Take your left hand and open and close it quickly for me. And tell him to open and close her left hand. And so... Just open and close the left hand. Kind of doing it on the right. Just but the left hand Unknowingly. Now. That's hard to do. Just do your best. And her right hand, you can see she's kind of drifting up. She's not actually doing that on purpose. This is mm -hmm. what we call the alien limb And now syndrome. if you'll open and close your right hand will start for doing me. things on its own. And then you see the apraxia, actually both hands here, of just opening and closing is difficult. The thing you mentioned to me was that sometimes you'll be in the kitchen with your husband. And what will your right hand do? It just goes up and touches him. Mm -hmm. When you're not intending for that to happen, correct? Yeah, it just goes up. Mm -hmm. Trying to hold it down most of the time. Just right. Stretch it back out. And when you get into bed at night, what do you have to do with your right arm? I uh, have to control, control it a little bit. All right. So that's another example of not only apraxia, but alien limb syndrome, which actually can be seen in different stroke syndromes as well. All right, so Mr. H uh, is a 45-year-old uh, Amazon packaging worker. Uh, over the past two years, become more anxious, agitated, uh, more disinhibited, um, and he just looks restless mo much of the time. So um, talk about Huntington's disease now. So Huntington's is uh, usually a fatal, uh, what we call autosomal dominant inherited neurodegenerative condition, meaning um, you get one of two copies from your parents, either a normal copy or um, an affected copy. So um, it's 50% inheritance from your parents, 50% uh, likely that you're gonna get it if one of your parents have it. Um, this involves kind of your caudate nucleus and your basal ganglia, uh, the cells die there. Um, we see chorea, uh, which I'll show you a video of in the next slide, um, really bad personality changes, psychiatric issues uh, that we'll talk about in a second. Um, and that's usually early on. And then later on, they actually look, if anything, more Parkinsonian, where an excessive hyperkinetic movement starts to become more slow, stiff, kind of um, trapped almost. So this is just a video of Korea. Is during the Middle Ages and later to describe the abnormal gait and stance of patients with Sydenham's chorea. We now use the term chorea, however, to define a class of abnormal involuntary movements. Choreic or choreatic movements consist of individual, brief, purposeless, non repetitive jerks of individual muscles. These tend to be rhythmic and non patterned but they appear in series or groups, which result in rather complex movements. The movements are made more complex by the patient's attempts to mask them by purposeful movements. 
Here we have a patient with fairly severe choreatic movements involving various parts of her entire body. Here we see movements involving the jaw, the tongue, the mouth, the neck. Each is an individual brief, sudden, purposeless jerk. In this individual, the choreatic movements are due to Huntington's chorea. The individual movements, however, look the same no matter what the etiology of the choreatic disease. All right, so with typical Huntington's, um, usually symptom onset in the 30s and 40s, death unfortunately within a decade, usually after developing symptoms. Um, and, but there's just a lot of early signs of, of personality changes, psychiatric issues. Again, these are not patients who grew up with depression or anxiety, uh, but then all of a sudden develop them. Um, usually difficulties with employment, um, managing their house, managing per, uh, relationships. So a lot of the times these patients are divorced because, uh, again, no one knows what's going on and they start acting weird and strange and ends in a lot of divorces, unfortunately. Um, there's impulsivity, like I said, disinhibition, um, just uh, very, very um, disorganized um, and random at times even. Uh, so the genetics related to Huntington, so there's a Huntington gene um, and there's a part of the gene that has this abnormal expansion of uh, uh, nucleotides that uh, expand to a certain number and once that number ex uh, exceeds usually 40 that's when you start having the physical symptoms and the actual disease of Huntington's disease and you can have a kind of a, um, a slow or extended disease if you have like 38 39 repeats maybe you develop this in your 60s 70s and and have a prolonged course and you don't really die of it you have very mild disease the more repeats you have, the more severe of a disease you have. Um, there's something called anticipation, where if you develop or if you uh, get the uh, gene from your father or from the male side, uh, that can uh, cause an ex a further expansion of the gene. And so you tend to have the disease at an earlier age and, and a worse form of it. Whereas if it comes from the mother, it's usually the same amount of repeats. So it's usually you'll have the same type of disease that your mom had. So genetic testing is very, um, uh, very sensitive in this case. Um, a lot of patients would like testing if they know their parents have it to see if they have it. There's a lot of controversy about this because right now there is no cure for Huntington's and there is a huge suicidal risk for Huntington's disease patients, even pre-symptomatic. Um, and so all of this testing must be done under the guidance of a movement disorder specialist, a psychologist, and a genetics counselor. Uh, to screen these patients before and afterwards. I mean, these are the these are so sensitive that we won't even give you the tests, negative or positive, over the phone. You have to come into the office. So um, now we are getting close, um, hopefully, to a cure. Um, all of these diseases are caused by the same reason. It's from one genetic abnormality, and we are having newer ways to affect your genome, including CRISPR technology. So um, if there was any uh, quote-unquote moonshot that should, should have been done as far as treating or curing a disease, it, it should have been Huntington's disease because as debilitating and, and to be honest, as um, severe as this disease is, it's probably the second most um, morbid and, and severe neurological condition um, other than um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease that one can have. Um, this, this is probably going to be something that we actually are going to be able to cure, in, hopefully in the near future. Um, so we talked about a lot of neuropsych issues, um, a, a lot of agitation, aggression in these patients, um, compulsive behaviors. We use uh, antipsychotics to manage the chorea, um, sometimes other medications. You really need a whole treatment team. So I'm a satellite site for the Hopkins um, Comprehensive HD Center. They mostly do the research there. I do the clinical care uh, for my Huntington's patients. But, um, you know, again, swallowing problems, fall safety, and then hopefully CRISPR technology for a cure in the future. 
All right, moving right along to normal pressure hydrocephalus. Got another video for you. So normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, we don't know necessarily why this happens, but it involves uh, your ventricles in your brain kind of expanding um, and does not cause extra pressure on your brain. That's why it's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, but it starts kind of almost eating into your brain, and so you have atrophy more centrally close to the ventricles, and it causes uh, what we call wet, uh, a, a triad of uh, wet, uh, wacky, wobbly, or wet is urinary incontinence, wacky is... Uh, kind of confusion, cognitive impairment, and wobbly is gait impairment, balance impairment. And so there can be a treatment for this. Um, it's called a, sh a VP shunt, where they put a shunt uh, in your ventricles to divert some of the spinal fluid that's being produced. <coughs> and it can really help with, with gait, especially. And back this way now. So this person with MPH, they have this kind of what we call magnetic gait, where their feet really don't like to leave the floor, kind of stuck as if a magnet was underneath the floor, kind of drawing their feet there, which is a little bit different than the Parkinson shuffling. You see it's a little bit wide-based. And then you'll see a video after a VP shot for the same patient, and you can see it. The now stand right form. there. Now what I want you to do is turn around 360 degrees. Can you do it? Obviously, much quicker, much more fluid of a gait. Uh, and come on back this to way. This speed a lot better, able to turn around better. Can you stop there? And now, if you again turn that 360 degrees and turn back and face me. Terrific. All right. And then men induce Parkinsonism. Um, so uh, you know, what you'll notice is backwards, uh, out loud. as she starts to have some mental distractions, so we usually tell them to start counting backwards or tell me the months backwards. Um, that kind of mental distraction can bring out a resting tremor, as you can see here. So she almost can you hold your arms out in front like of you now? Parkinson's straight out in front right? of you. Very good. Uh, but then you can see a little bit in her mouth starts moving. Can you open moving, and close your right hand uh, for me? Almost a slow chewing motion. This is what we call tardive dyskinesia. Tardive Good, meaning that's that she fine. has you just this make kind a... of dyskinetic movement from a antipsychotic or neuroleptic or anti-emetic medication. And so this is me medication induced not only tardive dyskinesia but Parkinsonism as well. And then lastly, just talking about dystonia. Um, so this is what I treat a lot, also mainly, like I said, with botulinum toxin. Just different uh, abnormal postures and muscle spasms can be of different parts of your body. Uh, most of the time, people have it of their neck. So whenever you see someone with a crooked neck, it doesn't mean that they have a spinal disease. It can mean that they have cervical dystonia. A lot of times it happens in women. Uh, you can see the different kind of postures that they tend to do. A lot of times you'll see a head tremor with no other tremors, like in their hands. If they have an isolated head tremor, it's mostly uh, from dystonia that can cause the tremor. You can have it different parts of your body, like I mentioned. So if you ever heard of writer's cramp, this is a type of dystonia that, in, that is what we call a task-specific dystonia. So really only doing the specific task of writing makes their hand and their fingers form into this abnormal posture and kind of almost abnormal cramping of their muscles versus if they're doing anything else, typing or anything like that, they don't have it. It's just with this one task. Um, musicians a lot of times can have a musician-related dystonia, a task-specific one. So you hear a lot about guitarists who can no longer play anymore because as soon as they start playing, their hand kind of cramps up into this specific posture. You can have um, involvement of your eyelids called blepharospasms, where they kind of always want to close shut tight. Um, we can use uh, injections for this too. Uh, again. Botulinum toxin injections are the treatment of choice usually for dystonia, mostly because when we're talking about dystonia, it affects a specific 
um, set of muscles. So there's not usually a need of using oral medications that can have systemic side effects. The, the botulinum toxin works at the muscle locally. So it's not going to have systemic side effects for the most part. And, and it works for a period of at least three to four months. Uh, so you don't need to worry about taking a pill every day. So that's it for my slides. Um, you know, I kind of want to end with a plug uh, to movement disorders uh, and somewhat neurology in general. But, uh, you know, I actually got involved with this pretty early. I was somewhat unique, but you kind of have to in order to, to get down this path of going into neurology as a field and then with movement disorders. But uh, the things that really drew me into this field um, so really, uh, you know, what, are, what other specialty can you really diagnose in real time, right? I don't need any testing or imaging or lab work or anything that will delay their, their tests. They come in here and sometimes after years of being misdiagnosed or not diagnosed, and in less than an hour, I will know what they have. Uh, I mean, these are the types of things that you, even though you give a, a not a great di diagnosis to a patient like Parkinson's disease, um, that they'll wind up in tears and want to hug you just because they have an answer, right? A lot of people just want an answer as far as what's going on. And so that's really rewarding to be able to, to again, just tell them right then and there and really talk about next steps, right? You're not just saying, all right, we'll talk after testing to see what's going on. It's, we know, I know what's going on. Let's, let's deal with how we're going to, how we're going to tackle this. So, uh, Neurology in general, but especially with part, with movement disorders, the, the art of medicine is really in display with this field. Um, there is no playbook, right? Um, it's we have lots of options for medications, so a lot of options for therapies. So it's really taking the the individual and tailoring the the medications to them, trial and error, and and kind of figuring out with with the patient profile that you have in front of you what what you think may work the best for them so uh, it, it really is involving you know again the true art of medicine uh, so with the medications even though they are not cures and they they're not disease modifying medications you will dramatically improve uh, this condition and and so technically all of these medications that I've been talking about are elective they're not going to die if they don't take them unlike some other you know heart medicines blood pressure things like that but the difference is they will know why they're taking them. They will feel dramatically better. They will want to hug you the next time they see you because they've got their life back. I mean, that kind of impact to a person's uh, quality of life is, is, is kind of unreal to see. Um, these patients are on a lot of medicines too. Uh, my Parkinson's patients are on three or four day dosing of medicines. And you would normally think, especially with all of our studies that we have for medication adherence, if we're as simple as blood pressure medicines, that is not great normally. These patients take their medicines and you can almost be confident of that. They don't always take them correctly, but they take them. And because and they know if they miss them, they feel awful. So these patients will know why they're on their medicines, will want to be on their medicines. Um, and so it's kind of really rewarding in that in that light. and And uh, to the point where they really, you know, they want to come see you because they know, you know, you have something that can make them feel feel much better. Um, this is a procedural specialty, so we get to do Botox and or like botulinum toxin injections, uh, deep brain simulating programming, which is really cool, really fascinating, and especially when you do the DBS, I mean, you can get real time uh, symptoms or even side effects. Uh, right in front of you. I can make a simple adjustment and their tremor goes away. I can make another adjustment and they can't speak, which uh, again, not, not necessarily something you want to do, but it's just an amazing thing that you can really control someone's brain in essence uh, with a push of a button, uh, which is kind of really interesting. And, and again, something that can dramatically improve their quality of life. And so we, we do all that programming and then the medication pump programming as well. Uh, you get to still put on the internal medicine hat. Uh, so as I showed you, Parkinson's disease affects almost, if not every organ system of the body. And so uh, with the exception of urinary issues, which there's some reasons why I don't necessarily tackle that, I address every other issue that's Park that a Parkinson's patient comes through with, whether it be constipation, blood pressure fluctuations, um, sleeping issues, depression issues, uh, you know, whatever you can think of, I try and dress myself. I just don't uh, refer out. And that's when, that's how most movement disorder specialists are, are treated because again, most of these things are related to their Parkinson's. So it's kind of unfortunate to be like, yeah, sure. You're, um, 
you know, your, your constipation is related to Parkinson's, but you have to go see a gastroenterologist. No, we, we take care of it ourselves. And then uh, really uh, neurology in general, uh, especially with Parkinson's, is really the last frontier of medicine. I mean, we know all there is there to know about the heart, the lungs, uh, kidneys, uh, but the brain, uh, it's, it's been exciting to see the, the difference in what we've learned just over the past 5, 10, 20 years. Um, and so your generation, my generation is going to be definitely on the cutting edge of, of all these cool things that we're going to learn, uh, and especially uh, medications, therapies, cures. Um, so it's something to really exciting to be practicing uh, within. So, so that's it. Uh, oh, and we're in high demand, so you'll always have a job uh, for what that's worth. Uh, but um, that's it. Thank you, um, and thank you for having me.